Hey guys, this is Beacon Vacations. Welcome back again to another installment of Talking Cinema. Yep, as you can see, I recorded this a completely different day because you know all the the fuzzy the fuzz on my face is gone. So anyway, um, pretty much we have. Let's see. Yeah, I'm not even close to being done yet, folks. There's like 490, 501 titles. They just added two more titles on IMDb. There was 500. There was 499, and and it looks like there's, they just added two more horror films. So should get this video done, and even by the time I'm done with this video, it's just going to be multiple different other. Uh, there's probably going to be even more horror films that are added to the list. That's a lot of horror movies for one year, folks. 501. That's a lot of horror films. Now, anyway, here we get. Uh, here we're starting off where I left off. Um, with a film called Teeth and Blood, which is a 4.8 out of 10, it's, it doesn't really sound like much, it's kind of interesting, I mean, I mean, it doesn't really sound like much, but the plot kind of sounds a little bit interesting, but at the same time, it probably isn't really that great of a movie, you get a 4.8 out of 10 on IMDb, it goes with a diva actress who was murdered on a, on the set of a film, Meanwhile, the city's blood supply is mysteriously being depleted. Detectives Mike Hung, really, and Sasha Colfax go undercover to crack the toughest mystery of their lives in a vampire-infested studio. I mean, the idea of a movie studio infested with vampires is kind of an interesting idea, but I don't know if that will carry over into a feature-length film. Judging by the 4.8, it doesn't seem like it really does. But that's, that's a decent rating compared to this other stuff. Uh, it's directed by Al Franklin and Pamela J. Richardson. It stars Glenn Plummer, Michelle Vanderwater, and Sean Hutchinson. Then we have a movie called The House on Pine Street, which gets an 8.5, which I'm pretty sure, to me, just sounds a bit too high. It do, the basic gist of the plot is this. It's a psychological horror about a young woman ho coping with an unwanted pregnancy after moving into a seemingly haunted house. Yep. That's it. It's directed by Aaron Keeling and Austin Keeling, and it stars Emily Goss, Taylor Bottles, and Kathy Bartnett. Then we have another film that gets an absurdly high rating on IMDb that I'm pretty sure does not deserve it. So, now that I've seen so many of these really, really high ratings on IMDb for movies like fucking Insectula, I think I have enough proof to say that IMDb's ratings are complete bullshit. So if you're worried about IMDb and you're worried about, oh my god, they don't like this movie. Well, I can't believe this movie that I like gets a lower rating. We shouldn't be really that worried about it, but it still sucks. I mean, Deadly Outbreak still doesn't deserve a fucking 4.0. Well, six, Deadly Prey gets a 6 out of 10. But, hey, it's something that we can deal with a little bit. It's okay. Because you have absolutely bullshit fucking ratings like this and sexua which it deals with a giant alien mosquito type insect that's drawn to earth from a from space is that what it is, is it drawn to earth from space it's about a giant alien mosquito type insect that is drawn to earth from the co2 pollution in search of blood Dell, a government agent, loses one loses his loved ones to the creature and is on a personal vendetta while Dr. Kempler is captivated by it and attempts to help the creature cleanse the earth. Sounds like an amazing movie, doesn't it? It's directed by Michael Peterson, starring Ariel Cezanne, Harrison Matthews, and Pascal Pila. It sounds like a fucking movie you'd see in the Sci-Fi Channel. And we, would you ever give a movie from that from the Sci-Fi Channel a 7.3? I don't fucking think so. Then we have the Quarantine Hauntings. What is there? They're trying to combine quarantine with a haunted ha with haunting with like a, a ghost story. Those two don't really fit together. But it deals with a 17-year-old named Jasmine who struggles to come with to terms with her father's death. She and her best friend Sky <clears throat> are left to take care of their younger siblings Zach, Blake, and Eva. Well, when their mothers Sandy and Catherine decide to go out on a girls' night out to give Sandy a breather, 
Jasmine and Skye take the kids to the notoriously haunted quarantine station to research the school assignment. Really? That's a, what what fucking school assignment entails you to go fucking research at a haunted house at a at a place that's notoriously haunted. What school assignment did you get? And who the fuck is your teacher? I mean, come on. What the hell? So anyway, this guy to take the kid the kids to the notoriously haunted quarantine station to research a school assignment where they find out more about a resident ghost named Jolene Denman, a.k.a. the girl in the pink dress. Okay. In an attempt to scare the boys, they pretend to evoke the spirit of the troubled girl, but when things start going terribly wrong, they begin to realize that their actions have had serious consequences. Jasmine and Jolene have a fateful connection, and that night, as Jasmine's behavior becomes increasingly concerning, Jasmine's boyfriend Cameron and Skye discover that the kids have gone missing. And they travel back to the quarantine station to try to stop the curse and save Jasmine. Sky and Cameron set out to find the kids, dot, 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 and that's it. And the tagline is, in order to face your demons, sometimes you have to encounter one. And, uh, yeah, that's it. That's, uh, that's the quarantine hauntings. Directed by Bianca Biazzi and, uh, Arnold Perez. Starring Lauren Clara Clark, Elizabeth Wilshire, and Delicia Christina. And it gets a 5.6. Then we have Di the Diabolical, which gets a 6.8. Which deals with a character named Madison. She's a single mother. And her children get woken nightly by an increasingly strange and intense presence. And she seeks help from her scientist boyfriend Nikolai. Who begins to begins a hunt to destroy the violent spirit that the paranormal experts are too frightened to take on? Might be interesting. Never heard of anybody from the cast, but that doesn't mean much. Might be interesting. It's directed by Alistair Legrand, stars Wilmer Calderon, Kurt Carly, and Marin Dungey. Then we have a film called The Night Watchman, which stars James Remar, where you have it deals with three bipolar night watchmen. And they try to stop a rampage of vampires that have taken over the city. But first, they must survive the night. Directed by Mitchell Alteri, James Remar, Matt Servatio, and Tiffany Shepes. I might give that a look sometime just for James Remar. I find it funny. It's called The Night Watchman. And it deals with vampires. And the, that's the name of a Tales from the Crypt episode. that <laughs> From the second season. Where it deals with... Um, I think it's uh, Malcolm McDowell plays a night watchman who's also a vampire. I, th I think it's kind of funny. <laughs> then we have a film called Reversal, which doesn't really sound like a film that I have any desire to see, but it gets a 7.6. It deals with a young girl who ends up getting chained in the basement of a sexual predator, and she escapes and turns the tables on her captor. It's directed by Jose Manuel Cravito, Cravioto with Richard Tyson, Tina Ivlev, and Amy Okuda. It just doesn't sound like... I mean, why would I want to watch that? I mean, I pretty much probably know how it's going to end. She's going to get revenge on the fucking killer. Which is going to chop his dick off or something. How many goddamn movies have there been made that deal with this same concept anyway? What are you going to do that's different? Reversal. Oh, this woman, she got chained and tormented by her captor and raped, and so she gets revenge. There's really not much else you can do with that subplot, or with that actual plot, even even if it was a subplot. There's nothing you can do. It, it's predictable, and I, I have no desire seeing it, because I'm pretty sure I already know how it's going to end, and I already know what's going to happen before even seeing the damn movie. Then we have a film called Bleeding Hearts, which, which uh, is directed by Dylan Bank. It stars Robert Loggia, Charles Durning, and Tony Todd. Decent cast. It's a 4.2 out of 10 on IMDb. Basic gist of the plot is this. Captured Hearts is an, an insane serial killer slash horror film. is a heart-jumping, heart-crushing, truly demented roller coaster ride and mystery, violence, sex, and gore. The raging climactic twist, all hearts end up in one place. It's not where they're supposed to be. 
It's not really called Captured Hearts. It's called Bleeding Hearts. So whoever wrote this got it wrong. And that's a shitty synopsis. It's just like... That that screams like on the back of a video videotape box from some company that's trying to just fluff up their film more and make it sound like it's this most amazing grand epic thing, but in reality it's just a shitty movie. <laughs> so maybe it does deserve a 4.2. Then we have a film called Axe to Grind, which uh, deals with the B movie legend, actress Debbie Wilkins. And, where, and she has just been replaced by a 23-year-old screen queen, screen queen in her lover's bed. More importantly, she's been left out of her lover's new film. And Debbie doesn't take this rejection well. And it actually stars Debbie Rashawn. It's kind of interesting. Directed by Matt Sattel. It stars Debbie Rashawn as Debbie, Guy Torrey, and Matthew James Goldbranson. I don't know. Might, might be interesting to see it for the meta aspects of the plot. We have a film called Abator, which deals with an investigative reporter who works to solve the mystery of a haunted house constructed from the rooms of the de of the deceased. Kind of interesting. Kind of an, an interesting idea. It's directed by Darren Lynn Bowsman. That name might sound familiar. He's he directed some one of the he directed Saw Two. He also directed Repo, the Genetic Opera. He directed Saw Three. He directed Saw Four. He, direct, he directed Mother's Day, directed that movie 11-11, 11, 11, 11, he directed The Devil's Carnival, he directed The Barons, which I've been curious about, but I haven't heard the best things, and, yeah. So, I don't know, he's kind of one of those directors that's kind of hit or miss, but I didn't mind Saw 2, so, we'll see, we'll, I'm, it's kind of an interesting idea. I mean, investigative reporter works to solve the mystery of a haunted house constructed from the rooms of the deceased. Just the idea of the haunted house is kind of intriguing. And it stars Jessica Lowens, Joe Anderson, and Lynn Shea. And then we have a film called Pod, which is directed by Mickey Keating. It gets a 6.8 out of 10 on IMDb. It stars Larry Fessenden, um, Lauren Ashley Carter, and John Wesselcouch. Basic gist of pod is a family intervention goes horribly awry when the, within the snowy confines of an isolated lake house. If you look at the poster cover art, it just reminds you of The Shining. And I think that's probably what they were trying to go for. It sounds like it. The, the intervention goes awry because it, it, spirits make the guy go fucking nuts. <laughs> that's what it sounds like to me. Larry Fessenden, see, he was in Habit. I think he also directed that movie, I think. I think he directed that film. Yeah, he directed Habit. He directed Wendigo. He directed the segment N is for Nexus from the ABC's The Deaf 2, which is actually a pretty cool segment. And I've heard good things about Habit. Habit is actually one of those films that's on the Fangoria 101 Most Unheralded Horror Films list. So, yeah, I'd be curious to check that out sometime. Habit. Pod, I don't know. Might be interesting. But it just, just sounds kind of generic. It sounds like a Shining clone to me. Then we have a film called The Gallows, which um, is directed by Travis Clough and Chris Loafing. It stars Cassidy Guilford, Pfeiffer Brown, and Reese Missler. Missler. The basic plot of, the plot of the film is this. 20 years after a horrific accident during a small town school play, students at a school resurrect the failed show in a misguided attempt to honor the anniversary of the tragedy, but soon discover that some things are better left alone. It sounds kind of generic. The Prey, which, which is directed by Eric Hensman and Matthew Hensman. It has nothing to do with that shitty movie, The Prey, from the 80s. It stars Danny Trejo. Oh my god, but fucking Danny Trejo, man. He's just in everything. <laughs> I, I swear, I think he does like 10 fucking movies every fucking year. Why? The guy has no fucking charisma. You hear that? Knock it on wood. This piece of wood is more charisma than fucking Danny Trejo. Stop giving him lead roles. Fuck's sake. So there's Danny Trejo, Kevin Grevog, and Nick Chinlund. 
It, sounds, it just deals with U.S. soldiers in the Middle East who become trapped in a cave that is inhabited by a deadly creature. Probably some shitty CGI monster and sounds like a boring movie. Then probably even more boring because of Danny Trejo's presence. Then we have a film called Pernicious. I don't know if I said that word correctly. It's directed by James Cullen Bressack. It stars Ciara Hanna, Emily O'Brien, and Jackie Moore. Basically, just the plot is this. It was supposed to be an adventure of a lifetime, as three young girls spend the summer in Thailand. But their adventure quickly becomes a nightmare when the trio unleashes the spirit of a murdered child with only one thing on her mind. Revenge. Ooh, another evil spirit movie. What do you fucking do? And we have a film called Dark Vision, which has a kind of a pretty laughable cover. And it's supposed to be scary, but it just looks fucking stupid. It looks like one of the Skeksis from from Dark Crystal decided to just put on a hoodie. And it's directed by Darren Flagstone, and it stars Bernie Hodges, Susie Latham, and Judith Haley. The basic gist of the plot with Dark Vision is this. There is more in the darkness than you know. Mindful host Spencer Knights. Is that really his last name? Knights? As in K-N-I... G H T S. Is this any relation to Baywatch Nights? Puts his crew in peril whilst trying to f win his own series as a part of the paranormal competition Dark Vision. Find out what manifestations lay in wait for his team inside Baylock's Folly, a place with a dark history and possibly a darker presence. Who is its Who is its mysterious caretaker, Clem? And what are the twisted motivations of the producers of the Dark Vision Hub? Step into the darkness and find the answers in this new wave gothic horror from Stray Spark Productions. And guess who, what, who wrote this plot summary? The guy who starred in the movie, who plays Spencer Knights. Might be interesting, but it doesn't sound like much. And the star of the film didn't do a very good job selling the movie to me. <laughs> so, probably skip it. Then we have a film called Let Me Out, which is directed by Louis, Louis F. Montalvo, with Michael, starring Michael Plachins, uh, Jacqueline, Jacqueline Siegel, and Bill Housekeeper. And basically gist of the plot is this. Mark, his wife Maria, and their two daughters were murdered one night at their home in a tragic and bizarre way. Two years later... A newly wed, couple, newly wed couple moves into this house and they start to experience some supernatural occurrences from the very first day. But the couple also believes they are not alone in this house. A year later, an alcoholic writer moves into this house and begins an investigation about the disappearance of his daughter that coincidentally happened to be around the same time Mark and his entire family were murdered. He uncovers what really happened to his daughter and the reason this house is possessed by dead people. But he also discovers who's behind all the tragedy and the horrendous murders that had happened all these years in the same house. The local priest believes this house is evil, and he wants no part of it, and he also believes everyone who dies in this house, that their soul leaves their bodies, but their bodies never leave the house. Written by Louis F. Montalvo, the guy who directed the fucking movie and also wrote it. Once again... These writers and directors and stars aren't doing a very good job selling their movie. This sounds like a generic piece of shit. There's like a million other ghost movies. No. Really? This 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 has to be a fucking joke. Does somebody just edit this? Does somebody just... I know you can edit IMDb. I don't know if you can create fake movie listings. I don't think it's like Wikipedia in that regard. This you gotta be fucking kidding me. You gotta be fucking kidding me. Are you fucking This is a bunch of fucking bullshit. I can't fucking believe this. What the fuck? Plan nine. Is this a fucking remake of Plan Nine from Outer Space? Yeah, it is. It's a fucking remake of Plan 9 from Outer Space. Wow.
I'm gonna need a fucking moment to let this all sink in, so I'll be back. What the fuck? Come on, man! Fucking clam knives about Have a dread two. No dread two. No dread two. Can't make dread two, but we can make a fucking remake. A plan nine from fucking outer space. It's not Mel Yellow, but it's gonna have to fucking do. Might as well be fucking alcohol. Ugh. 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 Oh, I hear the spot. God, where the fuck do I begin? Seriously, God damn it. First off, where is the fucking audience for a Plan 9 from Outer Space remake? Who asked for a remake of what is considered one of the worst movies ever made? Who asked for this? I didn't ask for it. My friends didn't ask for it. I can't think of one person that I know that asked for a remake of Plan 9 from Outer Space. I know Dread 2 isn't technically a horror film, but it's still, I still have a reason to mention it, because it have fucking, <laughs> you have a fucking Plan 9 from Outer Space remake, but no Dread 2. What the fuck is wrong with people? I understand Plan 9's not coming out in theaters. But the fact that it got funding and Dread 2 is not getting funding is the issue. It's the problem I have. Does this fucking thing have a trailer? I don't really know what else to synopsis. They don't really give me a synopsis. Oh, it does. It does have a fucking trailer. Well, fucking... Woohoo! Let's watch this fucking stupid thing. Ugh. Fuck me. Really? And I'm fucking outer space for me. <sighs> monster pictures. Be a monster turd. Public school. What is it, Raspberry Jam? Oh my god, the raspberry chance you need me. I believe we have a very huge problem. Destroying all the town. Practical effects? Okay. Dead guy. So you're gonna remake Plan 9 from Outer Space. It's not a masterpiece. Shortly after death, Plan 9 is not a, a masterpiece. Club of an unknown form of kinetic energy formed here. So you remake a bad movie with better special effects? I mean, the CGI is still pretty shitty here, 
but it has practical zombie effects, which are better than anything in Planet of Outer Space. Why is this a Planet Nine movie? Why is this a remake? Whatever did this, it's not weird. Bad acting. The Brian Krause. Really a fucking rap song? We need a plan. I got him. My face says a thousand words here. I'm moving on. I don't want to fucking talk about this movie anymore. Fucking Plan 9. <sighs> My film called Headless, which I guess is, uh, it's directed by Arthur Kolipfer, starring Shane Beasley, Kelsey Carlisle, and Ellie Church. And, uh, pretty shitty cover art. I guess it's called a lot. It's a lost slasher film from 1978. I doubt it. It deals with a masked killer who wages an unrelenting spree of murder, cannibalism, and necrophilia. Great corpse fucking. Just more one to see. But when his tortured past comes back to haunt him, he plunges to even greater depths of madness and depravity, consuming the lives of a young woman and those she holds dear. Not fucking watching that shit. Sacrament. Directed by Sean Ewart. Star Marilyn Burns, Dakota Buchanan, and Stanley Ray Baker. It's a 7.0 out of 10 on IMDb. That's a pretty damn high rating. Marilyn Burns. Yeah, it's the same, the same actress from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The plot of the film is this. Leaving the city behind for a weekend of booze, bud, and bonding at the coast, seven friends find themselves stranded en route to the Gulf Coast of Texas when a big storm interferes with their plans. The town of Middle Spring is more than happy to welcome them with open arms, however. Located in the rhinestone buckle of the Bible Belt. Rhinestone. Whenever I think of rhinestone, I think of that shitty movie with Stallone. Where it's like singing country music and shit. Stay out of my bedroom. Won't you stay out of doing shitty movies? Because I don't want to see them anymore. Please stay out of making shitty movies. Because I know you can do better than that. So then... So it's in the, it's in the located in the rhinestone buckle of the Bible Belt. Middle Spring is smack dab in the middle of a big barbecue and tent revival, and there's always room at the table for a few more warm bodies. Unfortunately, no one in Middle Spring is exactly who they seem to be, and this town takes the body and the blood quite literally. And the friends have to stick together as time starts to get run out, and they realize what's on the menu may be closer to home than they suspected. Sounds like a good time at the movies. No, it doesn't. Sounds like a fucking lame film. Another lame synopsis from a director. You could do, could you do better? I mean, I'm, I'm, if you want me to see your movie, if you want people to see your movie, make it sound interesting. But maybe they can't because the movie itself isn't interesting. So, it's probably the problem. Don't Hang Up, directed by Damien Macy, Alexis Washbrot. And it stars Sienna Golaroy, Greg Sulkin, and Bella Dane. Basically, just the plot is this. An evening of drunken prank calls becomes a nightmare for a pair of teenagers when a mysterious stranger turns their own game against them with deadly consequences. Just nothing. I feel nothing from reading that. Fuck that. Hang Don't hang up. 
if your movie's called Don't Hang Up, you got to try to make it so I want to listen to what your movie has to say. No, I'm hanging up. Like, uh, um, our movie deals with a bunch of, uh, the drunken prank calls and teenagers and mysterious drabs. Click. Lake Placid for versus Anaconda. It's turned Yancey Butler. It's come a long way from Witchblade and Hard Target. Nigel Barber and Jeffrey Beach. Once again, we can get a Lake Placid versus Anaconda movie, but no Dread 2. Not even a split second 2. Not even a release of split second in the United States. But we can, on DVD. Well, I mean a new one or Blu-ray. But we can get fucking Lake Placid versus Anaconda. Because that's what we want. That's what we want to see. No, it's not. Nobody wants to see that. People want to see Lake Placid versus Anaconda as much as they want to see some plumber's hairy ass crack. The old hag syndrome. This project is in development, so the data is only available. So it's in development, but it's supposed to come out in 2015. You need to change your release date. And plus, what kind of fucking title is that? The old, ha old hag syndrome. What? Does somebody get fucking the old hag syndrome and they turn into an old hag. We have a film called Clinger. Any relation to the guy from MASH? It's directed by Michael Steves. It stars Vincent Martella, Jennifer Laporta, Laporte and Ju Laporte and Julia Axe. Basically just the plot is this. Furman Peterson, a driven high school student, senior, has her life turned upside down when her overly affectionate boyfriend, Robert Klinger, dies in an embarrassing accident. When Robert returns to the dead as a lovesick ghost, he tries to reunite with Fern, only to have his heart broken. As Robert plots to kill Fern so they can be together forever, Fern will have to fight him to stay in the world of the living. Klinger is a blood-soaked coming-of-age story about the horrors of first love. You know, if I want to watch a movie that deals with a zombie and he's trying to get a date or trying to get in some girl's pants or trying you know just trying to you know go to prom or something I'm gonna watch I'm gonna watch the movie my boyfriend's back that's what I'll watch I'll watch that instead because I got smoking hot Tracy Lynn and, it's, and it sounds a lot better than the clinger to me clinger sounds like a shitter then we have a film called silent screams so it's a sequel to silent scream Directed by Vitaly Versace. Is she any relation to, to the to Gianni Versace or whatever? Andre Essen, played by Ella Baskin, says goodbye to his daughter Natalia, played by Sasha Kolos, and as she heads to America as a foreign exchange student, Natalia bonds with her surrogate family. Amanda Callan Coles and her father Marcus Garrett before strange supernatural occurrences begin to happen. The frightening events continue to plague them, leading up to a thrilling life-and-death struggle with a special appearance by Ron Jeremy. Director Vitaly Versace brings you a pulse-pounding, terrifying tale of horror and suspense that is sure to stay with you long after the final scream is heard. Bullshit. That's all I gotta say. Bullshit. Living Among Us. Don't know anything about it, except that it's directed by Brian A. Metcalf, stars Andrew Keegan, Esme Bianco, and John Hurd. John Hurd. Long way from home alone. Long way from home alone. James Russo is also in it, as well as William Sadler and Thomas Ian e. Nicholas. Thomas Ian e. Nicholas, the rookie of the year, plays a character named Mike. Okay. I have no idea what it's about, though. Film called Shadowhunters, Devil Speak. Is it related to fucking Shadowhunters? <laughs> I don't know. Was there a shadow? Is it related to that fucking shitty movie? <laughs> that has the tic tac toe cover art and the VHS cover art thing I did a while back. Tic tac toe, motherfucker! <laughs> is it related to the Shadowhunters? Because that's what it was called. It was called Shadowhunters. The one with the tic tac toe pattern in the background with the dude that has like a gun and like wearing a gas mask or some shit. You do not you do not want to fuck with me. I'm a badass a tic-tac-toe motherfucker. 
Shadow Owner. <laughs> then we have a film called The Shells, which is directed by Max Finneran. It stars Andrew Ridings and Sarah Chase and Britt Lower. Led by a madly enthusiastic director, a team of amateur filmmakers hole up in an, a former underground DOD research facility to make a film about a dream researcher who disappeared while in the midst of a secret neurological experiment. Weird title. I mean, it looks like a Pink Floyd cover art. Like something from the Pink, you know, Pink Floyd movie, but something you'd, you'd maybe like a segment you'd see in Pink Floyd The Wall. It kind of sounds interesting. I don't know. It might be interesting. Sounds better than some of these other fucking movies. A movie film called Gorgeous Vortex. Is that the name of that? Wasn't there a... I think that was the name of a short film that was supposed to, to uh, be in uh, ABC... Uh, supposed to be in VHS Viral. I think that was supposed to be in VHS Viral. But then they cut it out. It's directed by Todd Lincoln. I guess it follows a sinister, shadowy organization that is tracking a serial killer. It stars Rim Basma, Lindsay Clift, and Laura Eshman. IMDb is not giving me much in terms of synopsis, but I, I think that that was the yeah that was the name of a a uh, segment that was cut out of the film Gorgeous Vortex. I guess it's seven point one, but I, I, I they cut it out of the film because. Thought it was pretty shitty. And VHS Viral is a pretty shitty movie. There's only one good segment, so must have been pretty bad. And we have a film called Sleigh Bells, starring Barry Boswick and Ace. Megaforce isn't here to help you now. Not much in terms of synopsis. Richard Mall is also in this. Deals with Krampus. It's another horror film that's trying to deal with the Krampus mythos. Christmas horror movie. A film called The Three Furies, directed by Guy Norman B. with Dina Meyer. Don't know anything about it. Most Likely to Die, which is directed by Anthony D. Blasi. It stars Heather Morris, Jake Busey, and Titan Miranda. Well, now that I know Jake Busey is in it, I know this is going to be a. a an absolutely amazing film. This is going to be Oscar worthy. Because Jake Busey is in the movie. And the night before their 10 year high school reunion. The pre-party takes a deadly turn. When one by one former classmates go missing. Turn up dead according to their senior yearbooks. Superlatives. So does some, did the writer of this just see that Tonight Show Superlatives. Stuff with Jimmy Fallon. And is like oh I'm going to make a horror movie about that. Sounds like something that would barely work as a segment on a horror anthology, but not as a full film. But didn't they already kind of do stuff like that with a cutting class? Then we have a film called Wind Walkers. No, no relation to Wind Talkers. It's written by Russell Friedenberg. It stars Glenn Powell, Keoa Gordon, and Rudy Youngblood. Basically, the gist of the plot is this. With one of their own missing, a group of friends travel to the remote Florida Everglades where they discover that an ancient malev malevolent, malevolent, there's a damn word again, I can't fucking say, malevolent curse is tracking them. I'll just walk away from that movie. Doesn't sound like much at all. A house is not a home. Then what is it? Then what the fuck is it if it's not a home? I'm just saying. What is it? A house is not a home. What kind of fucking stupid title is that? It's directed by Christopher Ray. It stars James Condelec and John Condelec, Bill Cobbs, Richard Grieco. <laughs> Richard Grieco. There's a character named Ben. And Linda Williams. So Ben and Linda Williams, they move the family into a dream home in a last ditch effort to save their troubled marriage. Despite their good intentions, they cannot shake the feeling that they are being watched by something. Their unimaginable fears are realized when things inside the house take a supernatural and sinister turn. Ben and his family flee for their lives, but it is too late. The house isn't finished with them, trapping the family in its labyrinth. And the, family, and, and the Williams must come together as never before to fight for their family, their lives, and to escape. I guess I get the gist of the 
the title now because it's a haunted house. So it's no longer a home to them because it's haunted. Whatever, it's still a dumb title. House is not a home. Sounds like it, That sounds like a subtitle for a house sequel. House 5, a house is not a home. <laughs> then we have a film called Rage Midsummer's Eve, which is directed by T. Ricks. With uh, starring Michael Veradian, Holly Georgia, and Johnny Sachon. Uh, the visit just applies to this. American British friends studying in Finland just decide to take them to offer to travel to the Arctic Circle and experience the mysterious sub pagan celebration of Midsummer's Eve. Nah, skip. Inferno by Dante. Dante's journey through the worst of afterlife. Inferno. Yeah, let's do let's do uh, Dante's Inferno, but directed by a guy I never heard of, Boris Acosta, and starring Eric Roberts, Jeff Conaway, and Franco Nero. And it's two hours long, so good luck with that. Cowdor. Cawdor. Not Cowdor. Cawdor. Carry Elways. Wow. Well, long way from Robin Hood Men in Tights. That's 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 really pathetic. That's sad that Carrie always can't get any work. Best he can get a job in is a movie called Cow Cawdor. What the fuck is Cawdor? Directed by Phil Wurzel, stars Shelby Young, Carrie Elways, and Michael Welch. In this tense tale of psychological terror, Vivian Miller, played by Shelby Long, Sh Shelby Young, excuse me, is a young 20s woman who is serving out of, out of her jail sentence at a work release program in the Midwest. Her 90 days of probation takes her to the Cawdor Barn Theater. Okay, so that's the name of a theater. Still fucking stupid title. A dilapidated summer stock theater run by Lawrence O'Neill, played by Carrie Elways. Lawrence, a failed Broadway director, kind of like he's a failed actor, is now reduced to staging amateur productions with young parolees and raging over the mistakes from his past. Vivian's arrival in Cawdor, fucking stupid, starts a terrifying series of events that brings Lawrence's secret past to the present. After Vivian views an old tape stage production of Macbeth, a force of evil is unleashed which soon turns its sights on her. With the help of Roddy, played by Michael Welch, a local outcast, Vivian sets out about trying to discover who the supernatural killer is on the tape before she becomes the next victim. Cawdor. No thank you. A recent parolee, parolee is tortured by the curse of Macbeth. So pretty much it takes that theater sort of in-joke about don't say Macbeth, otherwise if something bad's going to happen and then make it so something really, actually, truthfully bad really does happen. Pretty sure it's been done before. Probably in some theater kids, some theater troops fan film. Another film called Slash 3. Is there a Slash 1 or 2? I, I, is, 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 there, is, is this a third film in a series that I've never heard of? Or is it like that movie Surf 2 where there's no fucking sequel? It's just... Just call it Slash. Okay, there's a movie called Slash from 2002. A rock band gets stuck on a haunted farm while visiting... An, it's a lead singer's family. Blood Sisters is also known as Slash. Shitty, boring movie from 1987. With a 2013 film called Slash. I don't know why Whiplash showed up for Slash on IMDb. But, um, yeah, there's no Slash 2. So why is it called Slash 3? doesn't make any sense. So it's directed by Jack Stannis and stars Jack Stannis and Carson Dahl and Victoria Simone G. And the plot is this. Five months after Jack Anderson and Jonathan Franco were attacked by Cody and Amanda, Jack and his thought-to-be-dead girlfriend moved to Massachusetts to start a new life in a new school. Soon after the arrival, things begin to happen in a much familiar way. A new ghost face killer has risen. This time it's personal. Ghost face killer? So is this like a, a fucking Scream ripoff? Okay. So are there three of these movies? Is this like the Bloody Murder series? Sounds like a piece of shit. Valley of the Sasquatch. 
another fucking Sasquatch movie. Come on, Matt. You know you gotta watch it. You gotta watch to get you got more Bigfoot movies to watch, Matt. You got Valley of the Sasquatch. Gets a 7.9. It's a really high rating, Matt. It must mean it's pretty good. It's directed by John Portanova. Stars Bill Oberts Jr., Jason Bale, and David Saucedo. And it deals with a fractured family who battles against a tribe of angry Sasquatch. Come on, Matt. You know it's going to be good. Got to see it. No, I'm just, I'm fucking with you. But seriously, probably sucks. Probably stinks like Bigfoot shit. The film called Two-Faced, which is directed by John Kearns Jr., with Jackie Holland, Tony Todd, and Dana Baldwin. Jessica has it all. Smarts, beauty, and an engagement to the handsome, wealthy businessman, Matthew. She's also a gold-digging bitch. No, that's really not what it... It doesn't say bitch, but... Gold-digging whore. <laughs> no, she's a gold-digging, hustling sociopath and a pathological liar who will stop at nothing to keep her luxurious lifestyle. Matthew's mother, Mama, comes to visit unannounced and has an instant dislike for Jessica and objects to their engagement. Mama catches Jessica cheating on Matthew, which leads to Mama having a stroke. Mama recovers from the stroke with a good prognosis. Killing the tough Italian mom is no easy task, and after a couple failed attempts, Jessica is in a race against time to silence Mama forever. So was it a horror film version of Don't Throw Mama from the Train? <laughs> Owen! Owen! <laughs> I don't want you to be around with that gold digging poor! But Ma! I like her! She, she, she gives good head! I don't care, Owen! Get rid of her! <laughs> Then we have a film called Amityville Theater. What? How many fucking Amityville movies are there? Are there 20 now? There's like the Amityville... What was it? There's Amityville Haunting. That Amityville remake was supposed to come out. Reboot was supposed to come out this year. But like it got... It, the release date got delayed. Then we have a fucking... We had like the Amityville Sanitarium or something like that. It was like, it was like a... Mental institution or some shit? And now Amityville Theater? What the fuck? It's written by John R. Walker with Mona Lay Lestrat, Lyndon Baker, and Kenny Benoit. I thought for a second it was Lyndon Ashby. I would have been like, Lyndon Ashby, what the fuck are you doing in an Amityville Playhouse? Which is the original title. So now they're calling it the Amityville Theater. <laughs> The plot is this. Following the tragic death of her parents, Fawn Harriman, her parents, Fawn Harriman, discovers she has inherited a theater in the town of Amityville. She, along with her three friends, decides to spend the weekend there looking, for the, looking, looking the place over. Meanwhile, one of her high school teachers begins an investigation into the village's past and makes a connection with something that goes back beyond recorded history. What else can you fucking do with the Amityville? What else can you do with Amityville? Amityville Circus? <laughs> the fucking Amityville Carnival? Amityville Roadhouse? And the Amityville Restaurants? Amityville Auto Repair Shop? What the fuck? <laughs> Just stop already. I know it's a name that's somewhat familiar that you can use because it's in public domain, but that doesn't mean it's an excuse to keep making fucking Amityville movies. Can this fucking franchise die already? I'm gonna quote Tom Lee Jones from Batman Forever. God, why won't you just die? Virus of the Dead, a zombie horror anthology which deals with an uncontrollable virus that turns the living into the living dead. Directed by Mark Allen Miller, Tony Newton, starring Catherine Eastwood, Sean C. Phillips, and James Cullen Bressack. Sounds like a ball sack. In your face. Not even bother with it. Another fucking zombie movie. But it's a horror anthology, so fucking what? <laughs> horror anthologies, there's also just a thing as shitty horror anthologies. And they are some of the worst movies ever, because you're watching... Multiple bad movies, not just one. That's why I like a good, a good in thor horror anthology. You're watching multiple good short films. So you get a lot of good movies for, you know, for one film. So it's really cool. 
but they also are very high risk because then you can get really shitty horror anthologies that have nothing but shitty stories. A film called The Inherited, which directed by Devin Gummersall, and that name sounds familiar. It was in My So Called Life. It's in Felicity. He played Philip in Independence Day. He directed other stuff. He directed Pork, a short film. He directed Lawn Chairs and Living Rooms. It's a documentary. He did a film called Robin Hef. Robbing Hef. Yeah. A film called Low Fidelity, which I don't, I don't know if it has anything to do with High Fidelity. It stars Nathan Darrow, Annabelle Scora, and Tammy Blanchard. And the plot is this. Eve is married to the man of her dreams, but when they return to live in the house, willed to him by his first wife, who died under horrific circumstances, it becomes a waking nightmare as Eve falls into a spiral of suspicion and madness. Uh, skip. The Barn. It's Halloween 1989. Best friends Sam and Josh are trying to enjoy what's left of the, their final devil's night before graduating high school. But trouble arises when the two pals and a group of friends take a detour on their way to a rock concert, finding an old abandoned barn and awakening the evil inside. Now it's up to Sam and Josh to find a way to protect the friends and defeat the creatures that lurk within the barn. Tagline is this, trick or treat, smell my feet, and die. And the soundtrack has a song called Little Bitches. Probably in a pretty shitty movie, but I'm kind of curious about it just because it takes place in 1989. <laughs> it's written by Justin M. Seaman, much almost Mussolino, Will Stout, Lexi Drips. Is the last name really Drips? It's pretty bad. Last name is Drips. <laughs> I guess she drips. <laughs> she drips a lot. It's probably a terrible film, but I'm kind of curious about it just because of the premise. And then a film called Haunted, I know nothing about. I know nothing! The Cutting Room, it's directed by Warren Dudley, stars Perry Glasspool, Lucy Jane Quinlan, and Lydia, Lydia Orange. Orange, you glad you're in this movie, Lydia? Probably not. These are college students, Raz, Charlie, and Jess. Who are about to start work on their end of the year media studies project. Sounds really exciting. And unaware of the malevolent force lurking deep below their sleepy town. A recent wave of apparent cyberbullying and the disappearance of two local girls leads the group to an abandoned army barracks situated deep in the forest that surround the college. What they find there is a terrifying truth. A, a terrifying labyrinth. Not truth, sorry. Got my got they got cliches mixed up here. What they find there is a terrifying labyrinth of tunnels from which there seems to be no escape, and a dark figure hell bent on tormenting them. Hunted, frightened, and lost, Raz, Charlie, and Jess must now escape the barracks or suffer the unspeakable fate that awaits them. Ooh! Sounds generic. Mansion of Blood, directed by Mike Donahue, with Gary Busey and Robert Picardo. <laughs> Gary Busey in Mansion of Blood. And the plot of the film is Millionaire Mason Murphy renovates the Haunted Mayhew Mansion. He moves his family to this state with his creepy servant Zachariah, played by Gary Busey. Oh my god. Gary Busey's gonna play a creepy servant named Zachariah? I gotta see this fucking movie just for that. Come on. Probably gonna be. This is gonna be hilarious. He plans a tremendous lunar eclipse viewing party to celebrate his return to his hometown of River Ridge, Iowa. Hey, man! <laughs> is River Ridge actually a real place? And, um. Yeah, Gary Busey in Iowa. At the party, a witch casts a spell to summon the spirit of her dead boyfriend. The magic runs out of control under the eclipse. A series of deadly accidents lead to the revenge killings, and then all the monsters come out as the party guests are murdered one by one. Each murder and death is unique and macabre and horrifying at the mention of blood. Who, if any, will survive? Horror laced with comedy abounds and is featured with over 60 speaking roles and cameos from the great legendary family names of Hollywood ro royalty, including si silent film star Carla Lamel. Interesting. So... Robert Picardo, 
Carla Lamel, Sam Stone, Alexander Kramer, I don't, Terry Moore. Paul Sizemore? Is he related to related to Ever Sizemore? Tom Sizemore? Okay. Directed by Mike Donahue. What else has this guy done? He directed Pool Time! He directed The Visitor from Planet Omicron! He directed Surge of Power! I'd be curious about just to see Kirk Busey play a fucking servant called Zachariah. We have a film called Fractured. It stars Eric Roberts. There's been a lot of these movies. Directed by Lance Cowas. Jake Busey is also in this. And Jordan Trovelion. And feels with May Oster, who's played by Athena Lebesis. is a beautiful, pensive, pensive, somber woman in her mid-twenties. A beautiful woman that discovers her boyfriend's bloody scarf in her apartment following a blackout episode. This unearthed white scarf is covered in crimson dri drives. Okay, this unearthed white scarf covered in crimson drives made an attempt suicide. Sorry, my brain just fucking f fucked up there. It had a fuck up moment. May is then taken to a psychiatric ward and under the care and influence of Dr. Ballard, a 58-year-old psychiatrist and acclaimed author played by Eric Roberts. May is immediately thrown into seclusion, and Detective James Harding, played by Jake Busey, appears to question Mary about a horrific murder. This questioning thrusts May into blah 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 blah. Doesn't even sound like a fucking horror movie. Sounds like a boring thriller. Then we have a film called Bad Exorcist. I mean, Bad Exorcists. Probably a fucking horror comedy. Exactly. Probably a really shitty horror comedy too. Deals with a trio of awkward teens who teens. Who intend to have teens. To a trio of awkward teens and intend to win a horror festival by making their own movie, but wind up getting their actress possessed in the process. And the, the tagline of the film is they're not good. The movie's probably not good either. Directed by Kyle Steinbeck, and it stars Alex Knapp, Sean Roney, and Julian Master. Nobody else you fucking know. It's probably a really shitty movie. And, yeah. We'll leave it with that for this installment. Stay tuned for more. There will be a bunch of different parts. I just didn't want to do this all in one giant video because, like I said, it would be like five or six hours long because I got boy, 501 fucking horror films in this year to talk about. So stay tuned for more parts later. And thank you for watching. And I will see you guys later. See ya.